Thanks, everybody. Um, this is great because this is the first, actually the first time I've ever actually held an iPad. So okay. I come to Bradford and I've, I've had some technology and I quite love it in these things. So, uh, yeah, my name's Julian Tate, and the past two and a half years I've been working while well, leading uh, Future Everything's Open Data Cities project, which is a project that set out to liberate all the public data that is held within the institutions, local authorities and public bodies within Greater Manchester. Um, and one of the things that fo followed on from that is, um, with all this data available, um, what, could, what possibly could happen? And how does it tie in with various kind of pressures and movements towards this, this notion of, of an Internet of Things? Now, the Internet of Things, as uh, the idea of the Internet of Things has been around since 1999 and probably as a concept much longer. It's one of those things that has probably been in, in uh, the subject of countless science fiction books and was probably in Star Trek at some time in the past. Um, some of us are aware of it, some of us might be actively working in this nascent field, but whoever we are, it will all eventually affect us. Right. These dates are very important in this story. Um, they'll probably pass most people by. I mean, why should they actually uh, matter to most people? But the reason why they're important is because of one organisation called the Internet Assigned Numbers Authority. It's not a, a, an organisation that we come across every day, but it's the, it's the organisation that globally manages the Internet Protocol addresses, or what was known as IP addresses, these are the addresses where, where devices can find each other on the, in a networked environment or on the internet. Now this type of address um, system, or more, more accurately, the address system called IPv4, who some of you might know about, um, was devised in 1981 and it could, didn't foresee, or it could never foresee what was actually going to happen with the internet. The internet wasn't actually even really invented, then, to be honest, or the World Wide Web. And it couldn't foresee the explosion in connectedness and what is actually happening in the world at this moment. And so on, mon on Monday, January 31st, 2011, IANA, the uh, Internet Signed at Numbers Authority, gave out the last five blocks of these addresses to their regional internet authorities. And on the 15th of April, two 2011, the Asian Pacific registry ran out. It ran out of addresses where things could find each other. Now, the idea of running out of addresses, of addresses is quite bad for the uh, Internet of Things. With IPv4, there was only kind of around about 4 billion addresses that were, that were available. And the and there was some technology that allowed us to expand, expand these, uh, these Internet addresses. I obviously saw these things coming else the whole kind of internet would have ground to, ground to a halt by now. So we now have a new internet protocol. This is, sorry, this is, this, this is a bit techy, but there is a reason for this. Which is now called IPv6. And IPv6 is not just bigger, it's several orders of magnitude bigger. Some people kind of approximate the amount of grains of sand in the whole world to be around about the region of 10, time, 10 to the power of 24. And in the known stars in the, the stars in the known universe are around about 10 to 25. So you get the idea of how many addresses have suddenly become available. So all known things could theoretically have their own IP address, which is amazing, but it's also quite scary. Why is this important? Because it allows the Internet of Things. Right, this is the map of, uh, that was created in the 19th century. In the 19th, the 19th century was a time of physical. Infrastructure was material. We had roads, we had canals, we had buildings. But now we're approaching a different age, the age of the immaterial, the digital, things that don't have physicality. And in this age where we're moving towards hyperconnectivity, where infrastructure exists to transfer connected um, information in the digital domain, this physical connectivity is valued, this, this digital connectivity is often valued or prioritised over the physical connectivity. With hyperconnectivity, um, addresses that can enable identification of all things known and some things unknown, it's a world where things can 
if enabled, find each other and talk to each other, instead of objects being discrete, being on their own and, and being discrete, they can act and be influenced by other objects and other connected objects. So what is often kind of described is, so your toaster can speak to your clock and your bath, however it would want to, I've got no idea, but this is how it's generally perceived with the Internet of Things. It will allow everything to talk to each other and make our lives much, much more, in, more easier. But I, I, I do think that we, we lose something of, the, of, of humanity when we, when we think of this kind of world. We, we lose our kind of connection with what are objects, how do we connect with objects. Objects are much more than just things. They have some kind of connection to us. And, and I do sometimes feel that in this world of the Internet of Things, we maybe do lose some of the humane. So anyway, so is this a machine-based hell or a future of technology, technologically um, liberated individuals? Um, I remember in the 1950s, I remember my um, father had uh, in his, a book from the 1950s that set out this vision of the future. This, and in the 1950s, it was almost like a brave new world. With things we just kind of left the austerity of the Second World War. And there was this idea that Never again will we, will we make the same mistakes as the past. Technology will liberate us. So I had this encyclopedia where there were vast, vast cornfields that were being automatically harvested by nuclear-powered machines whilst people just played tennis. And they did, this was the vision of the future. We would just be playing tennis or chess or maybe kind of planting a few gardens or, or watching telly, but it wasn't really kind of telly then. It was something else. But this is kind of a future, a very, a very deterministic future. And is it something that we really want? I, I don't think. I don't really think it is. This idea that technology will set, will, will, will liberate us, I, I think, is a, is a little bit of a misleading. And there are some people who are obviously very, very into that kind of deterministic route. But I don't actually think that's very good for us. So we need to be take. We need to take control. We need need to be aware of the opportunities that this these technologies can allow us, that we can make with these technologies. So, taking control. So, what can we do? At the moment, I like to think of the idea that we are, we are all kind of sensors. This is a situation that we, we find ourselves in every day. We use devices um, all the time that give out data. Um, we are sensors, at the, sensors in the moment in a big unconnected network, but we leave a trail of data that some people utilise. Things like people who have got club cards. Club cards collect amounts of data that allow supermarkets to stock things, that allow offers to be sent to you, that just by a, a transaction of saving a couple of pounds on a hundred pounds of purchase, um, you give data that will enable them to become more efficient. And the same with bank cards and credit card details. These are all kind of track habits and, and, and preference. And you have various systems such as kind of things that uh, congestion monitoring cameras and, and etc. that kind of follow where you, where you move around. But what I find most interesting is the mobile phone. The mobile phone, the most ubiquitous of devices, the device which we won't, don't generally leave home without. And some mobile phones, being a phone is actually a small, just a small part of what they actually are. Earlier this year in May, um, a little bit of a scandal broke when someone discovered that iPhones logged and tracked our movements. There was a little file that somebody discovered that basically recorded every Wi-Fi station, every mobile phone transmitter that, that, that the phone actually happened to come across. Now, some people kind of get a little bit cons conspiratorial about this, but the explanation was that it will allow much more efficient connectivity. Um, you'd be able to kind of remember passwords, remember, remember signals, etc. But what was interesting is that it spurred a group of developers to create a little program that you could download onto your computer. It will extract that file for you. And if you were so minded, you could upload this to a database. It was all open. You can go there now. And this database maps out the Wi-Fi connectivity and the kind of telecoms connectivity for, for quite a large portion of the Western Hemisphere. It didn't actually need many people because it was so vast. 
This map at the bottom, although there's a few glitches in it, is a heat map of Wi-Fi connectivity in the city of Berlin, with obviously the yellower bits are actually the, the bits where there's much more, there's more Wi-Fi networks and more Wi-Fi signal. But that is somebody <coughs> liberating data from a, from a system that wasn't that supposed to be liberated. And you find, I think we're going to find this more and more with, with these kind of systems, of, of these data systems, of these connected systems. So I think what we're going to find, and what we should find, is communities taking control of these systems, communities taking control in the Internet of Things. Now, there's a guy called Usman Hack, uh, develops a platform called Patchbay. Patchbay has been around for a few years now, but what it does, it allows people to monitor, to share, to create their own networks, almost like create their own Internet of Things. This is extremely powerful when we have situations where there's large organisations wanting to kind of make you use proprietary methods of capturing data, of, of allowing things to talk to each other. Patch Bay is, in, is open source, it allows you to create devices, it allows you to share data with other people, it allows, your, allows these, these devices to talk to other things and then these things can activate something within your environment or within your house. This is all very well and good, but even more powerfully, it allows you to do this. After the Japan tsunami and the, the uh, subsequent meltdown at Fukushima, there was very little radiation data that was being, that was being um, um, released by the authorities. And people started setting up patch base stations. So you, what you were getting was this connected network of radiation stations that were monitoring, that were allowed a, allowed a challenge to the data that was being collected by the, the authorities. They were much more granular. So if you go into Patch Bay and you move into this map, you can see how many of these stations that people set up. And this allowed people to say, look, you're not telling us the truth. It allowed people to contest and eventually, eventually kind of, I suppose, win out in the sense that it made the authorities realise that the, that the situation, people knew more than they actually, the authorities believed they knew. And obviously it brought about a certain amount of change. These kind of, when, you, uh, when you've got a system where you can allow people to collect their own data and share data in a communal way, you allow people, you empower people to, to basically stand up and contest official, um, uh, official methods and official, uh, official statistics, or at least they allow them to hold them to account. So I think this, things like Patch Bay are empowering and actually could help us take control of the Internet of Things. And also, what we're starting to see is a whole new world of maker culture. Uh, this place is Mad Lab in Manchester, which is home to a number of uh, hack groups, uh, special interest groups, the Open Data Manchester group, which is a group that I'm part of. People make things, people are exploring these technologies, people are not kind of passively sitting back. And there's, there's organisations in most large cities and towns. There's, we've got in Manchester, we've got a, a fab lab in Bradford. I, I, I hear there's soon be a fab lab. And by people coming together and people sharing and people understanding, that is hopefully how we will take control of the Internet of Things. So thank you.